All right, so today is five and five. Um, this month is Endometriosis Awareness Month. Um, however, we also tie this into value-based care with our certain screenings that just affect women's health overall. So the topic of this is women's health awareness. First, we'll go ahead with endometriosis, go over some of the symptoms, risk factors, diagnosis, treatment, and facts. So what is endometriosis? This is probably a common disease that many of you have heard about before. I know that I myself have heard about it. Um, when talking with my team, it's something all of us have heard about many times, but none of us actually really knew what it meant. So endometriosis is very common. It occurs in one in 10 women. This includes girls as young as eight years old um, on to postmenopausal women. It comes from the word endometrium, which is the lining within the uterus that builds up and sheds each month in the menstrual cycle. So endometriosis is the disease that occurs when this uterine tissue, including the endometrial glands and stoma, grow outside of the uterus. So when this happens, the most common areas where it, it will grow abnormally is in the ovaries, fallopian tubes, the ligaments supporting the uterus, the area between the vagina and rectum, over the surface of the uterus, and the lining of the pelvic cavity. It can also occur in other places, but these are the most common places where it does occur. So with endometriosis, this tissue thickens, breaks down, and bleeds with each menstrual cycle. However, when this tissue is elsewhere in the body, not in the uterus, it becomes trapped and does not have a way to exit the body. So the result of this can be internal bleeding, inflammation, irritation around the surrounding areas, the formation of scar tissue or adhesions. Um, it can form cysts that can then rupture and spread endometriosis elsewhere um, and other problems as well. So common symptoms of endometriosis, the most common is pain, and this can be, you know, slight pain, but can turn into severe pain. Um, other symptoms included in this are painful periods, pain during or after sexual activity, fatigue, infertility, heavy bleeding, pain with bowel movements or urination, diarrhea or constipation, or bloating and nausea. So you can see how Many of these symptoms can also be symptoms of other things. So endometriosis is something that, you know, especially if your member is complaining of things like this, um, it's, you, you definitely want to encourage them to see their primary care physician, but also their OBGYN. So risk factors included in endometriosis. Um, a big part of endometriosis is having extra or higher levels of estrogen in your body. So um, Risk factors include never giving birth, starting your period at an early age, going through menopause at an older age, having short menstrual cycles, for instance, less than 27 days, or heavy menstrual periods that last longer than seven days. Um, as I said, it is risk higher levels of estrogen or a greater lifetime exposure to estrogen on your body parts. So this you know, greater lifetime exposure would include that starting at an earlier age or going through menopause at an older age. Um, risk factors are also low BMI, familiar history, any medical condition that prevents the normal passage of menstrual tissue through the body, and reproductive tract abnormalities. So endometriosis is diagnosed in a couple of ways. So it can be diagnosed during a pelvic exam. Um, during this, your physician will look for abnormalities such as cysts or scar tissues, so they, they really feel around for, for that, those different abnormalities. It can be detected during an ultrasound, so either a standard ultrasound or a transvaginal ultrasound. Um, and this will help detect it, but it will not definitively tell your doctor whether that is indeed what you have. It can be detected via an MRI, which helps to create detailed images of the organs and tissues. So if surgery is needed, if this is something that is causing severe pain and interfering with you know, daily life, um, it can help identify where that surgery might be needed. And then lastly, it can be diagnosed via a laparoscopy. And in this case, a surgeon makes a tiny incision near your belly button, and they use a device called a laparoscope to look inside for signs of endometrial tissue. So it is something that 
you know, as common as it is, it does have treatment. So the most common, seeing as how the most common symptom is pain, the most common treatment is pain medication. And this doesn't necessarily mean, you know, high levels of narcotics. Um, it, it can be as simple as, you know, your doctor recommending Tylenol, Advil, um, some of those lower doses of the pain medications that can help, um, as well as, you know, alternative me uh, methods of pain um, reduction, you know, using heating pads, um, mindfulness, deep breathing. Um, they use hormonal therapy, so sometimes hormonal contraceptives, so different kinds of birth controls, um, GnRH agonists and antagonists, progestin therapy, aromatase inhibitors. Um, it can be treated through what is called conservative surgery. And this is really most common if a woman is experiencing infertility, specifically if they're trying to conceive and having that difficulty, or if endometriosis is really causing that severe pain that's in interfering with, you know, the ability to perform daily functions. Um, fertility treatment, oftentimes um, endometriosis is diagnosed when people are having difficulty conceiving, so those different f fertility treatments can help. And then in the case that it would be, you know, super serious, it can another treatment is a total hysterectomy. So just a couple of quick facts about endometriosis. So it is often undiagnosed. So as common as it is, it's very undiagnosed. So on average, there's a, there's a seven to 10 year delay in diagnosis, which this is a very, very long time. So again, if, if your member is, you know, letting you know that they've, they've got these symptoms, sometimes it can cause um, you know, people to almost feel like they're going crazy because they've got these symptoms, but no one can tell them what it means. Um, part of this is because it does have that wide range in type and severity of symptoms. So many of the symptoms of endometriosis can also be symptoms of other things. Um, and it's not one of those things that's as easy to test for. Like, you know, it's not just a simple blood test that all of a sudden says, yes, you have it or no, you don't. Um, pregnancy can relieve symptoms. So a common misconception is that pregnancy can actually cure endometriosis. Um, it cannot actually cure the disease, however, it can cause relief. And this is largely in part because of the hormonal changes that occur during pregnancy and because endometriosis is a disease that is, you know, a, a major cause of it is um, hormones in the body. Unfortunately, it does not cure it, so after giving birth, symptoms will usually recur. Um, endometriosis oftentimes runs in family, so if your mother has it especially or any other close family member um, and you're experiencing symptoms similar to what was previously discussed, you should definitely bring this up with your gynecologist or primary care physician so they can explore that and see if it's something that might be affecting you as well. Um, it can adversely affect fertility, so around 30 to 50 percent of patients do experience difficulty in becoming pregnant. And endometriosis does tend to improve with age. So most women do present with endometriosis in their 20s and 30s, and symptoms can then lessen with age. So next is our cervical cancer screening. So we're just going to go over quick what it is and the importance of getting screened. So cervical cancer facts. Um, cervical cancer is like any cancer, just a type of cancer, but it starts specifically in the cervix and is mainly caused after long-lasting infection with certain types of human papillomavirus or HPV. So HPV is a common virus that's passed from one person to another during sex. Um, it is a very common virus. At least half of sexually active people will at some point in their lives have HPV. Um, few women will get cervical cancer because of this, though. So when cervical cancer is found early, it is very treatable, and catching it early is associated with long survival and good quality of life. Some risk factors in cervical cancer are, as mentioned, the most common is long-lasting HPV. Um, oftentimes, this long-lasting HPV can come from having HIV or another condition that makes it difficult for your body to fight off those health problems, so that HPV virus. Um, like any other cancers, smoking is a risk factor. Um, sometimes some birth control pills for, used for an extended period of time can be a risk factor. Um, having given birth to three or more children, and having several sexual partners. So preventing cervical cancer, get the HPV vaccine. This is something that is mainly around 
um, you know, the adolescent years. Um, so encourage your friends to get it, encourage your your friend's children to get it, talk to your family about getting it. Um, the HPV vaccination is recommended for preteens aged 11 to 12 years old. However, it can be given starting at the age of nine. And it is recommended for everyone through 26 years of age if they're not vaccinated already. So insurance tends to cover the HPV vaccine up to age 26. And it is not recommended for everyone older than age 26 years old. However, some adults age 27 through 45 who are not already vaccinated may decide to get it. Um, at this point, it is important to speak to your doctor. Typically, the reason for this, this age cutoff, is because um, people tend to be sexually active, you know, earlier than 26, so they might have multiple sexual partners before, you know, the ages of 27 through 45. Um, and there also are different risk factors, though. So people who don't become sexually active until you know, 26 and on would be a better candidate for getting it than someone who, you know, may have been sexually active since um, their, their teens. Um, there's also, as mentioned, the different risk factors. So it really is determined by your provider if you are older than 26 on if the, vac the HP vaccine is something you still should get. So preventing the spread of HPV Use a condom. Protect yourself when you're having sex, if you're having multiple sexual partners. Um, and then also, you know, don't smoke. Smoking increases cancer. Smoking is horrible. Try to avoid smoking. So cervical cancer screening, as mentioned, when it's caught early, it is super preventable or it's super treatable and um, people tend to have a good prognosis. So people who are considered compliant for cervical cancer screening, as in people who, you know, have are good. Um, women 21 to 64 years of age, if they've had a cervical cytology, so a pap smear, performed within the last three years. So typically, you know, you go in for your annual OBGYN visit every year. Um, every three years is when they'll do the pap smear to test for cervical cancer. Women ages 30 through 64 who have had the high risk HPV testing within the last five years or women ages 30 to 64 who have both the pap smear and the HPV testing within the last five years. And then lastly, just talk to your primary care physician or your OBGYN and definitely encourage your members to do the same if they are women between these ages. Um, lots of people, especially once they get past their you know, early teens and 30s, think that this isn't really something that that's important anymore. But as we know, your, your likelihood of getting cancer does increase with age, you know, your, as your cells start to age, um, the chances that there can be abnormalities or mutations does increase. So just because someone might, you know, be married or no longer sexually active does not mean that they should, you know, that they're immune from getting cervical cancer screening. So people should still get tested for this. And then that pretty much sums it up. So are there any questions? This is really, really helpful. Thank you so much for this. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, like, like, I mentioned it's so very common so yeah. definitely breaking down the stigma of being able to talk about it and going and getting care for it is important definitely thank you yeah this is a pretty serious yes yeah it is pretty bad yeah that's why I wanted everybody to get on and get the information it just helps you to work with your member and know how to have that conversation hey Nicole this is Debbie yep hi Debbie so as a cancer I'm a cervical cancer survivor it's been four years that I've been, that you know, that I battled this this um this condition, and um this is very helpful. And for the PHNs, that I know that you guys, you guys, this is good and good information, so you guys can spread to your members, to your female members, and it's really important. The PASMIR is really important, the um for the women, the screening. Thank you. That's what I wanted to say. Thank I get emotional, you. but... <laughs> Congratulations. And yeah, this is really important. important. Thank you. Thank you for that input.